the tragedy is sometimes you can have everything right, mature, mature founder, and the market just doesn't support. And sometimes you can do everything wrong and the clown card just falls into gold mine by accident. Hello, hello, hello. I'm so excited for episode 78 of the Afternoon Tea Podcast, where we have an amazing guest of Meninder Dollywall joining us. Meninder, before we get into this, let me set this up if you please. Meninder Dollywall is an investor and advisor specializing in international venture projects and technology. She is the president and co-founder of Lionsgate International, a venture capital and business advisory firm specializing in international venture projects, the managing partner at Startup Studio, an accelerator and early stage venture capital fund, the founding chair of Thai Incubation Lab with a focus on supporting Canadian pre-seed startups and serves on the steering committee of the Thai Global Angels, the largest angel investor network in the world. Meninder has been recognized by several awards, including Business in Vancouver's Top 40 Under 40, Diversity 50, Canada's Most Diverse and Eligible Board Candidates, and Thompson Reuters Canada Top 40 Influencers in Finance, Innovation, and Risk Management. Meninder, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Chris. Oh, we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some fun. So tell me, why don't we just go straight out? Can you tell me the founding story of Lionsgate International, please? Well, of course. Um, I wish I could tell you the I had a great plan and then I put it into action. It was none of those things. It, <laughs> it was incremental, uh, mm-hmm. completely incremental. Uh, I was getting a lot of requests because I've lived and worked globally and I have uh, global networks in industry, uh, capital, in, in, in investors. So I was getting a lot of requests to people wanting to expand uh, from North America to Southeast Asia and from Southeast Asia to North America. So as a lot of requests were coming in, we were doing the one-offs. And it's oftentimes, you know, you have a technology product and you're taking it from one place in the world to the other and you need partners there, you need capital to make it happen. And rather than doing one-offs, which I did for a few years, we formed an organization to do their formally. And that was the... Um, uh, the origin and the genesis of Lionsgate International. And we've uh, adjusted to the times as the market changed. We adjusted to different industries, but the premise is connecting people with capital and expansion opportunities and uh, and helping them expand into new markets. Well, very cool, very cool. And you've been doing this for about, uh, I guess, in Canada for about a year, but it sounds like even longer internationally then. About 12 years. Yeah. Oh, 12 years. Okay, very nice. Well, to, my company's about 12 years too. It seems to be a really good time to have started a company. Yeah, so I, I really appreciate that. Well, Startup Studio, I love the name. You can't get more simple a name that makes complete sense. But tell, tell me about Startup Studio because it's a rel- relatively new uh, new organization. Yes. The, the, I would say the packaging is new, but the work is not. So okay. Startup Studio, yes, it's a super common name. And uh, you should see the struggle we had when we tried to register a domain or put it on LinkedIn. And I was like number 18 when we had oh, a no. LinkedIn page. Uh, but the uh, startup studio, it's part of Landscape International. The package uh-huh. is different because it's a different business. And I'll tell you where it came from. Uh, as I was doing a lot of angel investing as an individual, and this uh-huh. is super early. So Lionsgate, we get projects that are more, more further along. So they already have a market. They raised money. They're often post-series A. But before that, I was investing as an individual and uh, first year, 10 investments, all 10 of them didn't work out. And it's like, oh, oh that is, but nine out of 10 is pretty standard for not working out. But when you mm-hmm. talk to founders, uh, I realized the, some of them could have been extended, their runway could have been extended. And what they're looking for, the exact same thing that we were providing the larger companies, which is connections to industry. Mm-hmm. And in this case, it's not so much an expansion, but you're confirming your premises that you've product that somebody would buy and how do you confirm it by talking to somebody who would buy and making a buy it. Mm-hmm. That's the easiest way. And then of course you need capital. And the, the, right. the difference between startup studio is that it is a shorter, a lower dollar amount, shorter duration. Mm-hmm. So it's more of a pulse than wave. So mm-hmm. that was the only difference. And the packaging, yes, I we did that about two years ago, but existed as, you know, my hobby of helping my own portfolio companies for much longer than that. Oh, really? So I, th- I think you kind of touched on this. So the, the, the sweet spot for startup studio, them, that's like early stage. We're talking like pre Early stage. Yeah. Quiz okay. is a, and for what we are looking for is scalable founders and scalable product. And a scalable products is something that we think could do a series A as a hundred to $80 million company. And in this uh-huh. market is like 30 to 50 uh-huh. <laughs> of those type of projects uh-huh. and scalable founders 
is somebody who can run a company at that level. So you can convince investors that this person can recruit and retain talent. And it's a really subjective and such an unfair judgment, but you do make a judgment that can this, you take this founder to meetings and investors wouldn't think they have to be replaced because that is one thing we do not do. We do not have capacity to go in and run companies. We support them from the outside. So scalable founders, scalable products, pre-series A or under. That's a startup with sweet spot. I, and I think I think you're so right to be. I mean, the, the founders is is is, a, is as important um, as the product itself because you need the tenacious person that isn't just going to give up and the person who's going to pivot when the pivot is required instead of being stubborn. But do you have a weight that, that you've you know pre decided or is it a feel? How how do you how do you figure you know product versus versus uh, person? Let's just say. Oh, honestly, it's you know I could tell you it's an art and science that isn't. You, uh-huh. you just. Go with the spur of the moment, and I do work with really smart people, so we get a second and a third opinion, we hash it out, Oof. but even after everything you've done, you know, it's like they say no marketing plan survives first uh, contact with a customer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the other way is, I think Mike Tyson, I can't believe I'm quoting Mike Tyson, but he said everybody has plans to get punched in the face. It's such a and, beautiful one. <laughs> and taking a product and talking to, you know, first client and say, we have this amazing thing. And there's a pretty good chance they say, oh, we actually don't have that problem. Thank you so much. We'll never buy it. So, yes, I would say we are right more often than we are wrong. And right. that's why we are still in business. Very but good. I can tell you that we're right every time. That's not true. Yeah, that's not no, true. I, I, I dig that. But I, mean, but I really do love the fact that you do value the person because, you know, I've, I've you know, met many, 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 you know, founders and startup types in the world. And you could tell pretty quickly those who have, you know, the chops and those who, are going to run themselves to the ground and, you know, in a dangerous way, in the way that, hey, you know what? I don't think there's there's some sort of, I don't know, should I say quad? There's there's some sort of magic that that is required. Um, and, you know, it's the person who can take a punch. It's the person who can who can read the room and recognize that, hey, you know that, that deck I'm about to share? It shouldn't be shared. Actually, I should just, you know, I should be going with something slightly different dynamically. Yes. And if you don't have those skills, I, I think it is hard to invest in people uh, instead of over products. It is emotional intelligence. And Chris, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, they say, I, I, I know it when I see it. And uh, mm-hmm. but at the end, the tragedy is sometimes you see amazing projects with founders who need to be a little more grown up than they are. And that oh, yeah. is a snap part where you realize that it's going to run into trouble. Oh, for sure. And, you, know, you can't support. And this is one of the beautiful thing about, you know, founders and People are so malleable and configurable, <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and some of them get it. And this is, I think, it's uh, this is really a small percentage where you really can't work with them. But uh, some of them, they're all over the race. Some are already there, and some can go there. And it's just, uh, you know, working with smart founders is the privilege of this job. Oh, for sure, for sure. And also, you have to work with founders that understand, you know, that that is just a, like precede. A, C, A, B. That's a stage. It's not a goal to, you know, to say it's done. Because I've talked to so many founders who go, oh, just give me a million dollars. I'm like, well, what are you going to do with it? And they don't have the answer. And it's like, how can you not have the answer? He goes, oh, no, we won at that point. I'm like, that's like the beginning. That, 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 that's a million dollars you're going to burn through in six months. Is the, 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 you shouldn't be thinking that way. So, um, you know, um, that's where I guess sometimes you you want the mature uh, yeah. the mature people, but it's the young I people know. that seem to have the great ideas. So it's a tough I know. And dynamic. I know, Chris. Uh, the tragedy is sometimes you can have everything right, mature, mature founder, and the market just doesn't support. And sometimes you can do everything wrong, and the clown card just falls into a gold mine by accident. So I've seen that happen. <laughs> <laughs> that is a better quote than the Mike Tyson one. The clown. I love that. I am going to use that. I will quote you. I promise you. But I love that one. <laughs> well. Tell, tell me about the Thai Incubation Lab, please. Well, you know, it's all, we're we're coming more and more closer to the earlier stage. So mm-hmm. Thai is um, is a not-for-profit. It started in San Francisco about 30 years ago. And, you mm-hmm. know, as um, I, I've always believed in contribution to the community, so I tied my time. So 10% goes to charitable work. And at Very this nice. time, Thai is my only charitable work. Mm-hmm. I stepped down for everything. In fact, uh, um, you know, my assistant often, I don't, t- I ask her, don't tell me how much time I spent this week on Thai because I know it's more than 10%. <laughs> but the, I really believe in the power of loosely connected, expansive networks because mm. that's what I feel is my business on the base of. And I see mm-hmm. that, the power of loosely connected large groups. 
And Thai is, you know, they originally started as the Indus entrepreneurs, and Indus is the region of Southeast Asia. So it's India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, that's how they started. And these were folks from India who lived in San Francisco. They made a fair bit of money. They were successful, mm -hmm. and they wanted to help the next generation of entrepreneurs. And this is such a, and I'm going to say it's an Indian thing to do, quote unquote, I think I'm allowed to say that. Yep. But it is giving back is a big thing. And that's how the organization started. And I, I've been, I was a member, and then I realized I didn't have a lot of time to write that this was, and around 2018, we were talking about a discussion with the senior members of Thai. They had realized that we have such a powerful group Roughly. of 62 chapters around the world. And this is when, you know, people of Indian origin has started to run big companies. And now people of Indian origins are running big countries. The biggest. And we realized <laughs> we have a lot more power. And how do we put it to use for the greater good? So rather than networking for Indian people, how do we open it up? And we realize we have the largest angel group in the world mm -hmm. and loosely connected. And that's the beautiful thing about angel groups. You don't want a monolith. Mm -hmm. Monolithic groups do not work because if, if I'm writing a check, people that know me, they believe it. And then the clusters add little by little by little. So this was a natural, organic, just asset we have to put to use. So th th they were already thinking about the angel group at early stage startups and open it up to everybody. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, we've had uh, Caucasian presidents of chapters now. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Yes, and uh, actually the local chapter of Vancouver when I brought in, I think we have three Indian members. Well, and uh, because when you're talking about early stage startup, it's like, you know, reverse discrimination is as bad as discrimination because you're leaving resources, assets, people who can help Mm. behind why would you do that <laughs> that makes no sense to me you know you open it up be mm. egalitarian and uh, so any startup is welcome to apply there is no a form a column in the form where they have to tell us their ethnicity and that's true for investors that's true for founders <laughs> and it's open to everybody mm. and for us it's more like a connection to ties super strong in the u.s u.s is our biggest right. thousand angel angels so biggest in the u.s mm -hmm. and the biggest in the world and Canada is such a natural segue between strongest group, which is U.S., and the second strongest, which is India, and the third, which is Southeast Asia, Singapore, and the other groups. So that's uh -huh. where it came from. And sorry, the question we asked was Incubation Lab, and I lost track of that. No, it's good. As we brought the largest angel group to Canada, and um, I've been talking to them for a few years, and as uh, COVID happened, and you know, this was, uh, and I was like, I like the idea of bringing Thai angels to Canada. Um, mm -hmm. But what do I not do to do this? So you're so busy. And all of a sudden, uh, I was on my way to Northern Italy to meet some LPs uh, for my fund. And they said, please don't come. People are dying. This, there's something oh. going on. And by the, then, then everything was just locking down. And for the first time since I graduated from school, I had an empty calendar for the next three months, which has never happened before wow. with mm -hmm. all the travel. Mm -hmm. So I got back to Thai and say, guess what, guys, if the offer is still open, I think I may have time now <laughs> to do that. Fantastic. So I've been walking into group to Canada, and uh, the goal is for, you know, the uh, the 62 chapters, the incubation lab, where the premise came from, we found that the local uh, Canadian founders, they have brilliant products. But there's a little gap to where we in BC think projects are fundable and where American investors think they're fundable. Little gap. In some cases, the gap is structural. Mm -hmm. Then founders have to fix it over time. But in some cases, the gap is I'm going to say cosmetic or more of a communication or a little bit. What I mean, even I will kind of I'm going to call it startup studio light. Mm -hmm. That was required. And I was like, hey, guess what, guys? I have a formula for that, and I have people. And I have networks of a Fortune 500 executives, of, uh, you know, the Global 2000, it, a high level executives, investor groups. So why don't we, the way I tied my time, let's talk, give 10% of everything to charity. Sure. And that includes our network and our time and our resources. So that's where the incubation lab came from. We're the first in the world. And the plan is to have it expanded over other 61 chapters of Thai and help founders all around the world because we have all the networks, all the resources. It's just taking founders on the fundability scale and pushing them a little bit closer to where they're fundable at a higher free money by a larger group of investors. And I think this is Canada would benefit and I mean, every founder in the world should have this uh, resource available if they want it. Oh, for sure. I, know, I think I think I think that's wonderful. And, and again, I mean, I've been really blessed. I've actually gone to a couple of the uh, Thai events over, over the years. Um, and actually, I went to I went to one 
um, in Toronto during collision, um, maybe in 2018 or 17. And yes. um, that's where I actually got to meet a fellow by uh, Sunit Singh Tull from Datawind. I don't know if you know of him, but no. I, oh my gosh, he's he was the, um, created what was called, I think it was like the Akash tablet or something like that, which uh, yeah. it, the thing that blew me away was there was a diplomat from India there who yeah. all of a sudden when he was introduced, she just put up her hand and she started tearing up, goes, I actually got out of education poverty because of the tablet you created. You, the right. technology, because it was $35 tablets sold all over yes. India and, and I guess maybe Southeast Asia. And um, anyhow, I was, I was at that event and just thinking, oh my gosh, this is such a powerful Canadian Indian, you know, moment. And it was just, it, it was an honor to be part of it. And that's when I started realizing, wow, this, this Thai group, you know, where you do have Canadian roots, where you have, you know, Southeast Asian roots, this is something that's, you know, Canada can benefit from. So I'm really pleased to know that you are running running um an, an organization uh this way because i i think it's i think i think it's i think it's genius I, and also i'm really glad that you're saying it's not monolithic because i've been really blessed to have spent some time in india and india is not a monolith it is yes. a dynamic i mean we say we're multicultural here in canada you know what it's pretty multicultural in terms of all the different uh, ethnic groups, language groups yes all 52 of these official languages there are 52 languages on the indian currency it's amazing. So, just so you know, so yeah, so I, I, I speak with a lot of people around India, and uh, common language we have is English. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, and just imagine you had a Canadian Indian moment. We're having these Japanese Indian moments in Tokyo. There's an amazing. Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is, uh, in fact, I think other than South America, we are present everywhere. There's a Thai Nigeria, there's a Thai mm -hmm. Kenya, there's a Thai Ghana. So, and the power of that, and you know, this is. Uh, it's it's an the powerful really powerful group and the fact that it is well, you know the way I we we're talking about founders one of the other quotes that somebody came up with like how do you find a founder they said strong opinions loosely held uh, and I think that's a brilliant way to describe people and strong ties loosely held is how I would describe tie and that's there's a, love it you get the core strength but you get the flexibility of do the programming and our programming is aimed for British Columbia's technology system. We're mm. just taking the best of the tie, all the resources available, and see what we need. And that's why Incubation Lab launch, was launched here, because this is where we have the resources to mm. launch it, we have the need. And then 61 other chapter says, oh, we have the need too. I said, okay, let's work here for one year, create the formula, and you can replicate it. Mm. And that's the beauty of the organi global organization like tie. I mean, I, I love everything about it. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be trying to get to some more of the events now that I know that it's you know not just for... Um, you know, for people who are rooted in the Indus culture, you know, by, by birth or by ethnicity or anything like that, I, I, I really, you know, welcome, especially when we have such a strong presence here, here in BC, but, you know, across Canada for sure. Um, and in fact, I was in Korea last week and had um, some of my favorite Indian food is actually in Kusan uh, of all well, places. So, uh, you know, where you're saying Nigeria and Japan and all this, yeah, it, it is a diaspora and, you know, and a business one at that. So... Um, well, let me, let me, let me, let me take it back to kind of some, some more startup questions. So when, when, when is a company ready to raise capital? Do you think, when is it too early oh, or when is it right time? Well, this is, this question has different answers depending mm -hmm. on what we talk to. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I, agree. I mean, the founders say we're ready to raise capital when we need it. The investors, it's a de-risking question. Mm -hmm. And you know, the longer you wait, uh, the, uh, the more expensive a company gets, but less risky. So you have mm -hmm. to pick the sweet spot depending on where you are, but on average, you know, this, uh, the tech, tech world, the analogies we use, they all come from software and SaaS. And then when we applied them to climate and health startups, it's a slightly <laughs> awkward fit, yeah. but it, in startup, uh, start using the software analogy, uh, pre-seed is where you have an idea. And mm -hmm. if you can't build it with the resources you have, you raise a pre-seed, which is friends and family, mm -hmm. Apple, or basically what it means is people do who know you. So that means they're betting on you as a person, as a founder, because the project itself, there's no much to see here. Mm -hmm. We believe, oh, this person will be able to do something because we know them. So that's when they raise. And then the seed is, now you've figured out, you you know what it is, and now you're ready to expand. Mm -hmm. So it's a meeting of multiple forces. When the founder is ready and the investors, whoever is looking at it, thinks it's the right spot where it's not, not that risky and cheap enough for that. And that's that's the that's the time when they'll get money. 
For sure, for sure. I think of course, the market, Chris. I forgot the market. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So so if you were raising in 2020, uh, sketches of the back of the napkin were raising money. But Mm -hmm. even now, well, you know, it wouldn't be tech if you didn't have a bubble. And AI is a bubble. Right. Um, uh, Founders with pedigrees, they are raising uncapped safe nodes with sketches of the back of the napkin. They don't even need a deck. So Mm -hmm. that is always going on in tech. With some, mm-hmm. In some mm-hmm. sector of yeah. Well, there's, I mean, there's a lot of capital out there. It's just, it's it's not flowing as fast. But I mean, you keep seeing all these, you know, these uh, funds raising like huge numbers. So, you know, it's there. It's just, I guess, a little more risk adverse and maybe a little dislocated from, you know, everyone's waiting right now. Everyone's trying to figure out what's yes. happening. Um, it's, you know, we, we, have a, we have a fund. And so, you know, when we, it's not like we get all the money up front. Mm-hmm. We, the investors commit to a certain amount of money and then we do capital calls. That means, oh, we need this much. And, you know, uh, and so the LPs are slowing down because their portfolios are slowing down. So the funds are slowing down. But early stage where the numbers are smaller, that is still on fire. Oh, yeah. It's on, but, and that car slowing, the series B onwards are a little bit slower, but then I just saw a couple of hundred billion dollar rounds being so yep. it just depends on where you are, but overall, there's a little more thoughtfulness than we had about eighteen months ago. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Well, how do you approach due diligence when you're considering an investment? And what sort of red flags are you looking for? Oh, gee, it's, it depends on how it's not the project. Yeah, it's case by case. I get it. I know. It. <laughs> but you know, the based on it's all uh, highly subjective, uh, based on the market, based on the conditioning. But in our, in our case, our focus is B two B enterprise software. <laughs> Climate and health. So okay. those are the areas we those look are all at. Very different. Yes, they are. <laughs> but the what they have in common is the clients are B two B, and usually the contracts are bigger, chunkier, mm. larger, and they have a global potential. So once you get to the first part, like figuring out a new market globally, you have intellectual property and you can move really, really fast. Mm. So that's the commonality. So it's tough to get going and then they're fast. So what type we don't do, and we actually we've never done consumer products, we've never done double-sided markets, mm. we've never been in crypto. And uh, so that that was actually hindsight, but you know, I believe in decentralized mm. finance, but a digital photo that's worth a million dollars, I, I, I kind of, I'm kind of with Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger on this one, it yeah. never made sense to me, but finance having it in the hands of people, having it transparent, that does make sense to me. And oh, I, for I'm sure. with this quieting down, real projects rather than all that noise and come to the market. But you know, this is our, this is the world we are in. Um, tech mm-hmm. investors, we tend to be highly optimistic, mm-hmm. highly positive. Uh, the um, the upsides are asymmetrical. Downside is what you lose. You lose the money you put in. That's fine. Mm-hmm. It's, upside is as a fund, you want every investment to be able to return the entire fund. As an angel investor, you're looking at 100x or 50x mm-hmm. what you put in. And what you lose is what, what it's this. So yeah, in fact, you know, as the, as the the economy inflation was going up, and before the interest rates went up, and I was talking to a friend of mine who was in finance, and he's like, you know what? If we would all be okay, but if you if if your tech people weren't all making all these speeches and heating up the economy because <laughs> you just bullish on everything all the time, what you guys need to calm down. Because... <laughs> well, that's that's <laughs> super <laughs> interesting. <laughs> That, I mean that's super interesting. I mean I I really love there's the uh, the New York Times podcast uh, the the daily and, and and a couple of weeks ago they were talking about how all the tech layoffs you know when you, when you look at it in terms of like actual percentage of you know American workers versus how many it's it's actually tech is only like three percent it's actually a really small one so we're seeing all these chaotic layoffs but everywhere else it's actually high demand like but the yes, economy yeah. is so based on that negativity now of tech. That, that it is a real barometer of the economy, whether it's true or not, whether it speaks to truth yeah. or not. And of course, since the economy is a psychological beast at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's, yeah. I think that's interesting. Tech, we take up a lot of space in the room oh, as compared boy, to our ever. size. Mm-hmm. We take up a lot of space in the room. I look at the S and P. I mean, it, it depends upon tech companies, mm-hmm. the top companies, the tech companies, like though other non-tech companies are not even, so that's the scalability of it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so the people, I mean, you know, we're talking about layoffs. I, I know a couple of people, they found a job within a month. Mm. It's more in traditional industries. Yeah. And because they were starved for people before because we were outbidding everybody for the salaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why do you think most startups fail then? Oh, 
machine. I mean, cup, uh, you know, in fact, I did a presentation on Tuesday on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, that I could try. <laughs> <laughs> the, the math of what, why do startups fail? So in the larger picture of the premises, you're bringing something to the market that didn't exist before. So imagine a hug. It's, it's like, you know, Christopher Columbus traveling to find America. He just had a general idea. There's, I think there's land somewhere over there. So let's get into the boat and let's figure it out. That's pretty much what a startup is. You have a premise and over time you are getting, it's getting more firm and firm and firm and firm. But early stage startups, so let's let's break it down. So startups fail for many reasons, but early stage, this is seed stage. Because mm -hmm. the failure rate is about 90%. Mm -hmm. So you talk about the million dollar raise, even raising a million at sea, the failure rate is 90%. In the analysis that we did for the numbers we have, the project, I mean, it was about, uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember what the number was, but it was about 5,000 startups in North America that we crunched the numbers for. Mm -hmm. And 90% of them failed. Uh, so a 90 of them failed, but the ones who failed, nine out of 10 failed because they couldn't, what they raised and the runway they had, they couldn't come up with the end result that was enough to convince series A investors uh -huh. to write a check. So either they couldn't find product market fit with the time they had, or they couldn't execute on the product market fit because they cannot ran out of runway. And the third, if I remember correctly, team didn't have the right skills and uh -huh. they don't have the money to go hire for it. Right. And only 10% of the failures were for other reasons, but 90% was just running out of run. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes and sense. And in some cases, in some cases, uh, this is where bridge rounds, yes, yeah. bridge rounds will not even save you. They will give mm -hmm. you a lo longer runway. So some of the 90 can be pulled back if you do a bridge round, but others, it is risky business. It is Christopher Columbus looking for India and finding America, <laughs> and a lot of them not finding anything. No, I hear you. I hear you. And, and, and I guess one of the other risks, especially when money was really, you know, it fell down and you, it fell down and someone handed you money, let's just say, <laughs> is, you know, the valuations were so hot. Then when you cut, you know, the next round and all of a sudden, hey, that, you know, that, uh, that 10 X is more like 1.5 or even one, um, yes. you know, and, and, and it's just not as, as interesting an investment at that point too. And I think, I think you can raise too much, which actually hurts you as well. Well, yes, yes, you can raise too much, but I think if you have product market fit, and you have something you're building that there's uh -huh. a real business there, a down round is just part of life. We yeah. all know it. it mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, up. and it's for the last uh, 10 plus years, we didn't have a recession. Before that, they always happen. So mm -hmm. a company will see up rounds and down rounds. It was just part of the, the hard part of the point they bring up is, you know, there's companies who raise 10 million and 100 million pre money. Mm -hmm. And now they realize they actually don't have a product that anybody wants. And mm -hmm. the whole thing only worked because money was cheap. Mm -hmm. But those ones were going to fail anyway. Yeah. yeah. Now it's just a spectacular explosion instead of a quiet implosion, <laughs> which happens with tech usually. But if you have a product market fit, you have something you're building, just do a down round and keep going. It's, it's down round is a part of life. It's, yeah, it's mm -hmm. not that exciting, but in the end, the life cycle of a business is nine to six years minimum before mm. you get liquidity. So it's a long, it's a long haul. It's really long haul. Well, and I agree. And, you know, we're talking about cycles here. I mean, there's always cycles, you know, 2008, more, more in the States than in Canada, but uh, yeah, 2008 was a cycle, great time to do startups. Um, you know, yeah. COVID, obviously a great time to do, to, to do a startup. Now, you know, a little bit trickier, but if you can figure out a good way to, um, you know, stretch out your budget and, uh, you know, to get there, I think it's a really good time to do startups. Um, and we're looking at new, you know, I mean, you, you called AI a bubble. I'll say it's pretty transformational as well um, in terms of, you know, what, yeah. what it'll be able to do as well. I mean, I, I understand why you say it, like money's going into it, like, like no, no other business where it's not going into any other business. So I do, I yeah. do, do, I do understand that. What do you think, you know, we've, and, and this is a question that you, I know this is a, a crystal ball question here or, or answer for you, but when do you think the bottom hits and that we can start looking at uh, positive um, out of these cycles? Because the numbers are weird right now. Like the, the actual data is weird. When yep. do we see a bottom? Any 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 in, insights into that? Well, I see in tech, I don't think you do. <laughs> you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, AI will stabilize and, you know, it's, it's incredible. I was doing a presentation and I get a graphic designer to do the images. Yeah. And I use an AI tool. And but as a starting point, it was so brilliant. 
I gave a bunch of keywords and it came up with images, but then I had a graphic designer move them around because I didn't mm -hmm. have the ability to move around in that image. But starting point, it gave me 50 ideas for everything that yeah. I wouldn't have. So I believe in AI. And mm -hmm. honestly, I think I'm losing my grammar because Google is fixing it as I'm writing my Gmail. So that part, I 100% mm -hmm. believe. And where, when, you know, we see the AI right now, it is, it is a new territory. And you want to, as an early stage investor, you want to mark, you want to get a foot in the door. And that's why it's, and we know that we're invested in three, four companies that are about the same and one will go somewhere and the other will not, but we don't know which one right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's when it comes to the, I think with, with crypto, the different thing was, I think the things that were built were not all that useful. And I'm sure I'm I'm going to get hate mail saying that. <laughs> for, oh, I agree. People, I agree. But with AI, it is actually useful. Mm -hmm. It is actually useful. It, and I don't think we'll see a bottom, but we will see a maturing and a growing up. Right. And a lot of people who are trying things, they will not work. But that's what tech is. That's mm -hmm. been true for everything. When the new websites were launched, somebody raised money to raise fragrance to websites. We haven't, you know, but then, you know, somebody launched an online grocery store. Now we have the resources that I ordered Instacart yesterday. Mm -hmm. So we have Amazon, you know, I have a package coming today from Amazon. Mm -hmm. So sometimes mm -hmm. you're just too early. Mm -hmm. And this is where you build on people that have come before. For and sure. I don't think you really see a bottom. You just see either a realization that this is not useful, which was NFTs. Mm -hmm. And or it is maturing and growing up, which I think would be AI and generative AI. For sure, for sure. Well, you know, a question because I mean, you clearly know the investment side. You know, you talk, you talk the talk. I'm, I'm definitely, definitely, you know, appreciate <laughs> that I'm having a, uh, you know, a very uh, uh, enlightened conversation with you in that. But have you ever tried your own product-based startup yourself? Oh, gee, Chris, it's too risky. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Once you, once you know the failure rate, <laughs> you know, no, no, I'm joking. Yeah, seriously, I don't think it's ever come up. A couple mm -hmm. of times I've had, I'm going to say, good ideas. And I was able to run into people who were looking for an idea. So we invested in them and let them do it. Because running a startup is it's a 24-7 job. Oh, yeah. You can't do it part-time. <laughs> And it's not only that, you pretty much have to, you, you say, you know, in order to generate heat and light, you have to set yourself on fire. Yeah. That's what it takes building a startup. Yeah. And it, it is not, it's not for the faint of heart. And I just, I th uh, and maybe it will, it will come at a point, but I don't think, I, I don't like being a, uh, the founder of a startup. Mm -hmm. I'm much happier sharing what I'm going to say, what makes things better and easier. So rather than, you know, being the emperor, I'm more of the advisor to the emperor. And I like that role. I, I really like that. Like you know, I really appreciate your answer because, you know, it actually kind of breaks a little bit, I get to call it a stereotype in my own mind, where, you know, you have these founders who are relatively successful and then they try to figure out what to do with their money. And they think, well, I'm not going to come up with another idea, so I'll support people. And that's kind of how, you know, we'll say, you know, kind of the, the system kind of, you know, creates and churns and all that. But it's nice to know people who just recognize the industry, respect the industry, learn as much as possible, because clearly you're treating it like a science, and science, you have to learn every part, yes. every step, every stage, and understand the people too. And you know, and, and I like the fact that it's kind of breaking that thought of that there's a cycle to, to investment, whereas you know what, yeah. you know, if, if you educate yourself and you come in, you can, you can be successful with it. Well, I think, I, I think of it as gambling, except, you know, say, they say the house always wins and you are the house. Yeah. If you bet enough times, you win. Mm -hmm. That's the thing about investing. So when people, uh, you know, often I often get talk, uh, people talk to me, who are, tech people know this, tech adjacent people know this, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I have somebody who's made money in real estate. It's like, how should I invest in tech? Mm -hmm. And I always say, whatever money you want to invest in, split it into 10 investments and mm -hmm. do it over two years. Mm -hmm. Why am I here? Not at all going. This is where founders, anxiety founders get into trouble. They're so excited. They write all these checks, so, you know, the, like I told you, Chris, you know, the, the crazy point is I made the 10 investments and they didn't go anywhere. <laughs> and the ones who do go, you don't get any liquidity for six to nine years. Yep. So that's where you have to plan. <laughs> so split your money because, you know, it's like somebody, it was, the, I think some um, marketing person from a big um, American firm, he says, half of my marketing works. I just don't know which one. So half of my products would be successful, startups would be successful. I don't know which ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, 
and nobody does till you get to that point. So mm-hmm. it, it's a, uh, it's a numbers game. Yep. You have to stay in it. And if there's any, I'm going to say the golden rule, there are no absolute truths in the world. They're all, uh, they're all relative. But one golden rule is find smart people who are investing or who are working with tech companies mm-hmm. and they know what's going on in the inside. If you are investing in the technology, you either want to be part of an age group or you want to have friends who are investing and they tell you who are actually in the market. That's the easiest way. Looking at a deck and trying to analyze if you're not from the industry is really difficult. Oh, well, I really like that answer that, that you know, we'll, we'll call it 10, 10 by three, you know, 10, 10, 10 investments over three years. Because it's funny, you know, you mentioned that the people who made money in real estate and all that. I find every time I talk to a dentist, they don't want to be dentists. They want to be in tech <laughs> investors. And they're constantly talking to me about it. But I think that rule that you just gave me is when they ask me, I'm like, oh, I'm not too sure what yeah. to advise, you know. I think your practice is doing well. Stay in that. People need dentists. But I think your 10 by three is one of those passive ways of looking at it and, and saying, hey, hit the brakes. Do it logically, which which I think is important. Um, so yeah. I thank you. I'm going to personally use that piece of advice. I I, yeah. I I think that's I think that's wonderful. Well, you know, I just want to touch because you know the, the, again the theme of you know afternoon teas around around the Canadian entrepreneur and yeah you know you've been living in Vancouver for a while. But can you tell me about you know why did you move to Canada and when? Well, let, let me just make a comment on dentists first. So yes, okay, dentists are notorious <laughs> for that. They're notorious for that. And in <laughs> di- my dentist, my dermatologist, my masseuse. Yep. Uh, my chiropractor, everybody's asking for tech tips. And dentist is a bit hard because they put that thing in your mouth and then they start asking you things, right? Yes. <laughs> I think just tech is just so seductive. Yep. And that's the, you know, the privilege of our business is everybody's interested. So uh, to answer your question, <laughs> what to Canada? You, you know, uh, UBC gave me a scholarship to do my master's degree here. <laughs> so that was the premise of coming to Canada. Before, I mean, I applied to U.S. universities, Canadian universities, and my understanding of Canada was, you know, first of all, National Geographic, a lot of cat connect. So I see a lot of Canada there. And then every American movie, they commit a crime and they hit for the Canadian border. So <laughs> I got admitted to UBC with a scholarship. <laughs> and I was like, well, it's all polar bears and criminals, but, you know, at least the education is free. So let's go there. And, you know, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And I am wonderful. Extremely grateful for, you know, the, it was, it's a um, university and the Canadian government, a lot of it, I believe, was the alumni co- committing capital towards bringing global scientists to Canada, <laughs> giving us an opportunity. So this was an applied science degree <laughs> and partially covered by a scholarship of somebody who really loves science. And <laughs> this, so that, yeah, I'm super grateful for that. And it was an amazing, amazing opportunity. But that's why uh, that's why I, I'm in Canada, and you know I, I have a Canadian a Canadian passport is the only passport I have. <laughs> but I do love working globally, and I do appreciate Canada, especially you know after you spend the time in New York, and <laughs> you know you come here and you're walking faster than everybody else, and everybody's like, "What? Where's the fire? What's going on?" <laughs> Canada's nearly, and then you spend time in Canada, and you go back to uh, you know New York, and I'm expecting somebody to hold the door for me. I almost had to end up with my nose broken because oh, no. I didn't. Have- for me and I expected that they would because I've spent too much time in Canada. I love Canada, mm-hmm. but the, especially the part where we fit into the global business and it mm-hmm. provides an amazing platform to work around the world and still be Canadian. I sure, I sure appreciate that. And it's nice to know that you went to UBC like, like, like I did. I'm trying to get my daughter to go. She's uh, wanting to move away from Vancouver. And uh, um, it breaks it breaks my heart when we have such a great university right here in our backyard. Sometimes kids need, kids need space. They need space, you know? Yeah, well, I'll be happy if she goes to McGill, too. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Um, well, tell me about being honored as a, as a 40 under 40 by a business in Vancouver. How, that must have been that must have been a very nice oh, uh, thing to receive. Uh, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's humbling. It's it's mm-hmm. a privilege. I mean, you know, you, you uh, do things that you'd like to do, you want to do. And in our business, it's so much heads down. Mm-hmm. Just and it's so much fun. Honestly, you don't need to do anything. That's the fun. It's his job and fun and everything. All the what? Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, yeah. It's it's a huge honor when you know they're like, oh, we're I'm actually getting. Uh, I think I'm shortlisted for two awards this year. I can't tell you which they are, but but you know, and it's such an honor. It's like, oh wow, like somebody else recognizes it. Mm-hmm. They get doing great things. And one of the things I've always called myself as, as as a woman of color, as a, somebody who's a you know, especially some uh, technology and finance and something that. I don't know it a lot, but people come to say, oh, you know, my daughter is six or my daughter is 11. And, uh, and these are East Indian folks. And they're like, 
Perfect. We really, we, we have this, we rent your bio out to this Indian magazine that it's like, oh, okay. That's nice. You know, so it, it's a, it's a, it's a good way to give people, um, you know, I don't know what's the right word, but hope and confidence because oh, yeah. we all want to see ourselves represented. And, you know, friends of mine, they, you know, I, I work with the African American woman and they're, they're. Like when Lizzo won an award and when Halle Berry won an Oscar. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's so true. And, mm. you know, it gives you. So I think in that way, it's great. But it's it's just a humbling and it's a privilege that people recognize that you're doing something worthwhile. And, and honestly, I'm just doing for the fun of it. And because I like it, <laughs> everything else is just an icing on the cake. Well, and I love that. It's, it's great to have it, though. You know, that was that was that was an awesome answer because you're not looking at you in the present. You're looking at those in the future, you know, emulating and seeing a path that you helped carve. Yes. And I think that's a humble. You know, I'm even say that's a real Canadian answer. So I I, I really appreciate that. I was going to uh, say it's an Indo Canadian answer, but <laughs> you know what? That's that's fine too. It's because yeah. yeah. it, you know what? That's yeah. that's what makes Canada so interesting is that you know we get to have the names of yeah. our, I guess, our original ethnicity or part of our ethnicity in the front instead of in, in, yes. in the back. And I, I think that's important. Yeah, I think my good people, it, it, uh, and it's always, do you think of a group, but it's an individual. And I was at an event out in Surrey. It was done by an Indian uh, magazine. And, you know, mm -hmm. I had a, I had the flu, I had the jet okay. line. I didn't want to go, but I was like, okay, you know, let's, let's, it's so far away. Uber is like $80 to Surrey, but it's like, okay, let's, let's go. I went one great. Mm -hmm. But I went, and after the program at the event, uh, a woman, a couple came to me and they said, oh, you know, our daughter is 13 and the Indian folks and, you know, the father is a cab driver and the, and the mother, were, I think she works in some kind of a recycling plant at that point. So these are real, you know, and well, you know, that's what my folks would have been doing. I'm a middle class kid from India, right? right? So it's engineering and education gave us social mobility. Mm -hmm. So I really, they said our daughter's a math genius and we always try to put her into traditional things. And... Uh, by watching you, we, I think, and I was like, wow. So I actually found a bunch of mass tutorials that I sent it to her and I was like, you know what? There's a scholarship available at UBC. When she gets to that point, you should reach out to me. Oh, because wonderful. somebody that's smarter, this is the beauty of Canada, is the mobility is there for immigrants. Mm -hmm, and so, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I'm not while it works now, but the mobility <laughs> for immigrants that's available. And I told them, you need to uh, get her out to the junior achievement Mm -hmm. He should be part of that. She should be participating. And I told him, you need to be, Indian programs are great, but you need to be, quote unquote, participating in mainstream Canadian programs mm -hmm. because, trust me, it's not an issue what skin color you are and what your accent is. Nope. Canada welcomes you. And you should, and I, I, I've heard from them a couple of times a year. I hear from them. And I'm waiting to see what she does with her career. Maybe she would become a scientist. Maybe Love she would it. go to Harvard. Maybe she'd go to Stanford. You'd be seen. You'd be seen. Okay, he's going to, but you know, and that to me is it makes it worthwhile, mm. you know. And uh, I mean, not all the other awards and awards and everything, but making a difference in somebody's life and especially changing the mind of the family that would have usually been against her. Mm. Like, girls don't do math, and they're like, Oh, you talked about you being an engineer, so girls do math, oh, yeah. and they do end up doing okay. And, and I was like, Yes, they do. And sorry, I, I digress, but that was a story I have to share. Because tying it to an individual just makes it so much more real than, you know, bigger is great. People are inspired in general, but that one story oh, makes, for sure. makes it real for you. You know, and, and I'd just like to share also for, um, just for our listeners, there's this, um, there's a program that's, you know, from, 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 from Caddy and Vivian, who, uh, who have had on the podcast before they, they help out with a group called Yell Canada and Yell is for, through yes, high school. Yes, yes, yes. And they yeah. just announced, I think it was yesterday that you can do it Canada wide now. So that if, if anyone yes. is in the high school age and interested in learning more about, I mean, it's not just tech biz, it's biz in general and learning the tools and, and working with two of the most amazing people on earth that in Caddy and Vivian. They do a um, great job. I'm familiar with them. Yes, they do a great job. They're amazing. I mean, just announced Vancouver Startup Week's about to kick off uh, in, in the summer. Too. I mean, lots of great stuff they do for the community. But I just wanted to share because I think, you know, you're looking for extensions of, you know, of opportunities for some of the, you know, this 13-year-old young lady, as you said. I think this is a really good opportunity to, especially when it's expanded just beyond specific schools. Yes. Um, so I, I, well, I just I wanted she's to gonna share do that. Well. She's, she's going to have some intellectual property her, to her name before she's 18 and all amazing. that. Yeah, but it's, and there's so many bright kids like that in, oh, yeah. we have around the world. And, you know, and then there's two ways of doing charitable work. One is lifting the floor for some, and the other one is raising the ceiling. 
I love and that. business dealing for high potential people. And that's where incubation lab, what we're trying to do with Tide. And that, that, that part is absolutely thrilling. It's, it's a privilege. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to do that. An honor and a privilege. And I'm, I, I, I'm very pleased that you are doing the work to help so many, so many of those who, who, who benefit from it. Well, as, I, I, again, as you know, the Canadian, um, or the, the theme of the afternoon tea is to speak to wonderful, you know, Canadian based entrepreneurs like yourself in order to, um, expedite that next generation, which is exactly what we're talking about here. Um, I have these two questions I, I always ask, and I just wanted to, you know, hear your opinion on them. And we've already shared some some pretty good tidbits, but let's see if we can get one golden one out of this. Is Can you share one piece of advice to help younger Canadian founders? Oh, yeah. Wow. I think one thing I would say is I re- look at the world more than just where you are locally. So I uh-huh. recommend, you know, listen to multiple podcasts, read around the world, be knowledgeable of your industry and where you're building that business. Because in tech, there are no borders and there are no boundaries. If you <laughs> build an amazing product, and I think it was a Robert Frost who said, even if you live in the forest, people will find a way to where you are. And I'm paraphrasing him. I forgot the exact thing. <laughs> but it, and that's what I would say is it's great to be Canadian. It is There's so many advantages, but be a citizen of the world and see mm. what's happening in the world and what you're doing. Builds relationships with founders around the world, investors around the world, because it's such a great platform to build off of. Oh, for sure. But be aware of what's happening in the world. Uh, I think I think that's really great. I think that's really great, especially because every product should be global, or at least you should be thinking global. Because if not, your 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 TAM is, is just not big enough for. Uh, it's just not big. Enough. No, not at all. Not at all for the investors' appetite. Well, last question, and I, and I thank you so much for this. But can you share the name of a Canadian entrepreneurial star or founder that you personally look up to? Oh, gee, there's so many. Is oh, it, Chris, there's so, so many. Uh, there's a cluster of founders that have just gotten into Thai Incubation Lab. Okay. We work with them, and they are absolutely brilliant. I can't get into the names of those guys <laughs> because we, we don't want all investors piling up to where they are before mm-hmm. they're to race, but they're just absolutely brilliant. And these are young people with the emotional intelligence and just so bright. You have to actually wear sunglasses to think about their future. They're so bright. Love that. But if I have to name a few names, I mean, mm-hmm. it's a, not a, even a comprehensive list. I think Boris Wurz is a really, really smart guy in town. Boris I absolutely amazing. love everything about him. <laughs> Daryl Koke, who's running CDL out of UBC now. Yep. A, lot of, a lot of respect for Daryl. <laughs> and my friend, Catherine Dahl, who built and sold Beanworks. Yep. She's a formidable, formidable female. And oh, yeah. uh, I wish to call her a friend. And there's, oh my God, I, I could go on like 50 names and still not be done. So I apologize to everybody who's not included. But we are just so privileged, and this is one of the things we're trying to do with Incubator is getting all these people's knowledge and while, while being mindful of their time and having it spread across a wider group of founders because in the end, we need the next generation mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. the next one after that to absorb all this and make it their own and build on it. And that's how we make the ecosystem better. Love it, which is the theme of the podcast, and I think we're singing the same song. Well, Meninder, thank you so much for for joining us today, and I, I look forward to following you and uh, all the the great things that you're 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 doing and uh, in in the community here. Wonderful, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. 